Hello, everyone, and welcome to Accessibility for People with Disabilities in Direct Legal Services, Intellectual, Developmental, and or Psychosocial Disabilities, co-sponsored by Legal Aid at Work and Disability Rights and Education and Defense Fund, or DREF. This webinar is hosted by the Legal Aid Association of California, also known as LAC. My name is Lauren Lofton, and I am the program attorney here at LAC. We are the membership organization for California's civil legal aid nonprofits. Our job is to advocate in the legislature, in the courts, and with the State Bar of California on behalf of the community of nonprofits that serve low-income Californians. In addition to our online and in-person trainings, LAC provides coordination and advocacy for increased funding to support organizations like yours. Today's session is presented by Alexis Alvarez from Legal Aid at Work and Sylvia Yi from Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Before we get started, we want to mention a few logistical notes. If you're having any technical difficulties with the GoToWebinar system, please call 877-582-7011. If you have any questions about this specific webinar, you can email trainings at lacconline.org and a LAC staff member will try to get back to you before the webinar ends. Everyone on this call is muted. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send us questions using the chat box. This session will be recorded and materials will be posted online after the training. So you will have access to those things in approximately three business days. Captions are added to the video recording. And now I will pass it off to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, my name is Sylvia Yi. I'm the senior staff attorney with Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, or DREF, as I will refer to it. We've been around for about 40 years, based in Berkeley, but we also do national work. Um, and we work in the range of issues that affect the lives of people with disabilities, from healthcare to education um, to employment. And so I'm so pleased that you've joined us for this webinar. Um, I'm just briefly introducing myself and turning it over to my colleague, Alexa. Hi everybody, my name is Alexis Alvarez. Uh, I'm a senior staff attorney with a disability rights program at Legal Aid at Work. Uh, Legal Aid at Work advocates primarily on behalf of low wage workers and their families um, in various areas of um, employment. Um, and in the disability rights program, we also work on issues related to access to government programs and services. I am um, very grateful and excited to be here today. Um, I am a person with a psychosocial disability, and so I'm particularly excited to, to talk about making uh, legal, legal services accessible um, to folks with intellectual, developmental, and um, or psychosocial disabilities. Um, we will be taking questions as the presentation goes on. Um, so if you have any of those, um, you know, please feel free to put them in the chat box. If at some point we do get a little bit crunched for time, we'll just let you know that we'll hold your questions until the end. Um, but we'll handle that as, as that goes along. And then we will be um, reading the content of our slides for accessibility purposes. And um, again, as Lauren said, if you do have um, any concerns, I believe there's uh, information um, in the chat about who to reach. Okay, um, so I am going to keep talking and move us right along. Um, first, I uh, wanted to provide an overview about today's webinar. I'm going to be starting with uh, discussing some basics of disability etiquette. And then Sylvia is going to talk to us about stereotypes about people with disabilities in the media. Then we're both going to discuss some accommodation strategies uh, and best practices that we've used in our work. Um, and then Sylvia uh, will uh, talk about ABA's model rule 1.14, um, the attorney-client privilege, and how that might interact with some of these accommodation strategies that we're going to be discussing. If time permits, we will also be going over a couple of scenarios um, to try and um, give some concrete examples of um, some of these accommodation strategies and how they might 
play a part in uh, a particular situation and of course um, leave some time for questions. So starting uh, with disability etiquette, uh, some basics around choosing your words. Um, and it is important to cultivate awareness around language and the words that we use. Um, and in this case, particularly the words that we use about people with disabilities. Uh, as you all know, language, the language that we use, um, particularly if it is um, offensive or derogatory, it can exclude folks and create barriers to participation. So I wanted to spend some time um, on some do's and don'ts uh, regarding language uh, um, and people with disabilities. So um, the first thing is not using the term handicap or handicapped. Um, and the reason behind this uh, is because it is uh, offensive and derogatory to folks in, in the disability community. Um, and that's because it, it casts disability as a personal flaw. So um, it actually comes, um, I believe, from horse racing and jockeying. And the idea was that there would be you know, this superior animal that would then be given a limitation um, basically to, to put it on equal footing um, or as, as the rest of the, the horses racing. And so it does um, cast disability in a negative light. And so instead of using those terms, um, you can use the words uh, disability or disabled. Um, for example, instead of using, um, also instead of using handicapped parking, you can use um, the words accessible parking. I did want to mention that there is a bit of a debate uh, in the disability community about whether to use person first language. So um, talking uh, like I identified myself earlier as having a psychosocial dis disability versus a saying that I am a disabled person. I use both terms. Um, but this is a matter of choice. And so it's important to, um, above anything else, I think, uh, respect the person's choice about how they want to be uh, identified and use that language. Um, you know, and if you're not certain about what kind of language to use in a specific situation, um, then, you know, depending on your relationship with the person, you can ask or, you know, just use the, the person's name. Um, another don't is uh, to not use words like suffering or overcome or despite to talk about disability. Again, this um, cause, cast disability in a negative light. And really, the idea is to move toward understanding disability as a part of the human continuum, um, you know, that people with disabilities are the same as everyone else. Um, and that, you know, they're, we're not suffering, we're just living life in, and managing life in a different way. Um, and so that's another thing to be aware of. Similarly with um, words like special or inspiration, when discussing um, accomplishments of people with, with disabilities, um, people with disabilities um, having accomplishments is not something unusual, and so those accomplishments should be admired in and of themselves, um, and not because um, the person has a disability. Um, the last thing I'll mention with respect to this slide, again, is to use words um, like disability or disabled to respect personal choice with respect to identity um, and to just be aware and mindful of the language that you are using. I also wanted to spend some time on actions. 
um, and some common issues that come up for folks when deciding how to act around disabled folks. And the main message in this slide is treat people with respect and don't make assumptions. Um, disabled folks are gonna be the best judges of their own abilities about what they can and cannot do. Um, so don't make decisions for them. You know, if there's an activity, if there's, um, you know, um, a particular event um, that you are, you know, at work maybe considering inviting folks to, um, you know, that should be something where you're just inviting everyone. And then if, if a person with um, a disability uh, it does not want to join in, then they will certainly let you know that. Um, but it is important um, to ask those questions and to find out what the person wants and not um, make that decision out of uh, uh, an assumption about what that person can or cannot do. Um, and this dovetails with the second point, which is to ask before you help. Um, again, you know, if somebody needs help, um, typically they will ask for it. And sometimes um, good intentions um, can result um, in unintended consequences that aren't the best. Um, and that uh, is related to the next point, which is to be mindful about physical contact. So for example, um, you know, some people might be triggered by touch without permission. Um, so, you know, asking people about whether um, they're okay with uh, shaking hands or hugging, um, that's, you know, something that I uh, try to do. The other thing is that, you know, um, depending on a situation, it might, uh, you know, if somebody has mobility disability, it might throw them off balance. So it's, it's just good to be mindful of these things. Um, and to ask questions if you are not sure. Um, and it is also important to respect personal space. This includes things like mobility equipment and assistance animals. Um, again, those are things that, um, you know, shouldn't be touched without first making sure that it is okay for you to um, touch them. The next point about thinking before you speak and respecting privacy, um, primarily wanting to get at questions about disability. Um, and generally, you know, if you don't know someone, um, you don't want to be asking questions about this, the, this, their disability unless that's relevant to your conversation. And, um, you know, as with everything else, um, if somebody wants to, to share, they, they will do that. And so it's um, important to respect privacy. And again, if, if you're not sure what to do in a, in a situation, um, the best thing to do is to ask. Um, and I'll just round out this section on, on some basics about disability etiquette with, um, you know, it's people do make mistakes and, and people aren't perfect, um, but you know, if if that happens, if you use the word handicapped instead of um, disabled or person with a disability, then just be sure that you, you own that and you commit to doing better the next time um, and that you continue to build that awareness as you're, you're moving forward. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to Sylvia now to talk to us a bit about disability stereotypes in media. Thank you, Alexis. And again, if anyone is having trouble hearing or have hearing echoes or anything, please let us know. So disability stereotypes in media are, are quite pervasive. Uh, some of them date back centuries. Um, one of the first things is, is when you have someone with a disability, there's often uh, an association with helplessness or an association with violence. Um, I think, in fact, we see some of these stereotypes coming up in very current affairs uh, when you have someone like the president speaking about shooting violence um, and, and bringing up uh, mental health 
and the need for institutionalization. Um, that's uh, in a, a stereotypical association that is unfortunately being broadcast at a very high level um, right now. Um, another stereotype is that dis someone's disability is the, the primary or the only characteristic portrayed. Um, sometimes in movies, a person with a disability, in fact, most of the time, a person with a disability is not a main character, but you could have a minor character, a sibling, someone associated, and the only thing you know about that character that pops up on the screen or in a book is that they have a disability. Um, Another stereotype is that, uh, is that often there's, there's no nuance to, to functional capacity. So that you have uh, someone presented with an intellectual disability and they, uh, he, or, he or she or they has um, no capacity at all to, um, to manage the affairs of their life or they have full capacity. Um, it, there, there is sort of no nuance and often our laws in our, in our state reflect that. that, that um, a guardian is appointed and an individual with a disability, an intellectual developmental disability, then has no more control over their life um, as opposed to control over some aspects of their life that they're perfectly capable of managing. Um, often with people with disabilities, there is no overlap with between disabilities. Uh, and that kind of stereotype has been, we've seen that in sort of in the healthcare field, like someone who, let's say, uh, uses a wheelchair and has a mobility disability may not get adequate screenings for, um, for mammographies or other preventive screenings. And there's somehow this sense that, well, lightning won't strike twice. You're not going to get cancer. You already have X. Um, and that's a, a very unfortunate stereotype we've seen. Um, and one of the last ones, which I, I think dates back to fairy tales, is, is that disability, having a disability is balanced by some special gift or some other um, ability. Uh, one of the most obvious examples might be the assumption that, oh, people who are blind have an extraordinary sense of smell. Uh, and that might be the fact, but that also might not be a fact. Um, so with some of these stereotypes, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the some of the things, uh, some of the the relationships between um, disability and other personal characteristics that we see in film and in movies, since that's one of the biggest media that we are all exposed to. Um, there's been a pretty recent report by uh, University of USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative. So I talked about TV characters and film characters and found that less than 2% of all film characters and roughly 7% of TV characters experience mental health conditions on the screen. Um, so that doesn't reflect the experiences of, of the movie-going uh, movie -going audiences, where close to 20% of the U.S. population reports some form of mental health condition or illness per year. Another thing to note is that 46% of film characters and 25% of TV characters with a mental health condition exhibit violent or aggressive behavior, something that experts say is divorced from reality. I think it's referring again to some of the, the, the mass shooting or the, the, the violent incidences that we see. I think the figure I've seen is 4% of them are associated with someone with a mental health disability. In fact, someone with a mental health disability is far more likely to be the victim of a violent incident rather than the perpetrator. Um, there were, and this, these are all statistics for sort of the last, over the last year, roughly. There are only 13 incidences of suicide or suicidal attempts uh, in the films that were examined. and and six on television. And the, the portraits of suicide often lacked sufficient depiction of the character's larger mental health issues and did not look at treatment options at all. In terms of race, no film characters with mental health conditions were Latino or Hispanic, nor were any Middle Eastern, North African, Native American, or Pacific Islander. Four characters were Asian, and 11 were African-American or Black. 
And finally, no LGBT, LGBTQ film characters had mental health conditions across the 100 top films of 2016, and only eight TV characters across 50 popular shows um, had mental health conditions. And this occurs despite the fact that um, mental health conditions are often three times more likely to occur among members of the LGBTQ community. Um, a lot of that is through, as we've seen with um, national surveys, a, a lot of um, the, the great stress and trauma that the LGBTQ community members experience um, because uh, from the discrimination uh, that they encounter in their lives. So that's just a, a, a bit of a rundown of the, the kind of media that surrounds us all the, all the time and the kind of images we see. And speaking of images, here are some contrasting examples in media. So I do want to stress that these are from different periods. Uh, the first example, which depicts uh, an ad that comes from um, the 19, a 1976 ad in the General Annals of Psychiatry uh, depicts um, an African-American man in an urban setting. He, he's wearing what, what looks like sort of a, a, a disco shirt and jacket and is shaking his fist angrily. Um, and the text above him says, assaultive and belligerent. And the ad then goes on to say, cooperation often begins with Hal Dahl. I, uh, it's an interesting thing to look at as a matter of perspective. 1976, um, that you have a clear association of violence and, uh, of, and black male um, and a, 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 a clear indication that, well, medication will fix everything. Um, it will take away the threat to society and will fix the antisocial tendencies of this individual. So the other image that I have in this slide is a movie poster from much later. Um, it's from uh, two, the 2011. Um, I'm just trying to think of when uh, A Beautiful Mind first came out. Um, it's, a, a, it's a movie that came out um, with starring Russell Crowe and Jennifer Connelly and Ed Harris and it was directed by Ron Howard. It was a pretty big sort of cast and it came out and it, it talks about the life of uh, John Nash Jr. who was a Nobel Prize winning economist and who was an individual who also has schizophrenia. Um, so in, in some ways, I, I, so I do want to point out that a lot of time has passed and we see far more nuanced um, associations between mental health and, and race in some ways. Um, and we also see better examples of mental illness. Uh, for A Beautiful Mind, the, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, honored A Beautiful Mind. So it did come out in 2001. And it was honored at NAMI's 2002 National Convention and praised as a, quote, breakthrough on how Hollywood portrays mental illness, end quote. Um, so in many ways, John Nash Jr. was not portrayed as um, an angry, uh, an angry individual, um, or a violent individual. But unfortunately, some of these breakthrough portrayals tend to feature white middle-class men or women, um, and not uh, people of color. So. The, as a result, this especially stigmatizes and isolates men and women of color who never see themselves fully or accurately portrayed in media. And so I just wanted to point out that even as there are progress in some fronts, there's often a backwards uh, step in others. So, I, Alexis? Oh, let me just see here. Hmm. Okay, so I'm sorry if you guys are having trouble hearing me. I, let me try. Okay, 
Um, this is Alexis, and, and apologies, um, I was muted, um, but I fixed that. Um, so before we switch gears to start talking about um, some general accommodation strategies uh, that can be helpful um, across the board, um, I did want to um, take a step back. We did get a question um, earlier, uh, which was um, asking about the term uh, special education. What about using special education as a term in light of um, what I've said about language and using terms like special and inspirational. Um, and I think, you know, it's a tough question because we do have, you know, a whole area of, of practice around special education. It's the term that is used in schools, in courts, in case law. And so, you know, there's, there's a bit of, um, you know, a, a limitation around how much change can be made when there is this structural use um, of a term. Um, you know, that being said, um, you know, everybody has um, different styles of learning. And so, you know, I suppose you could say um, everybody's educational needs are special in their own way. And so, um, you know, making this uh, distinction for kids with, with disabilities, I think, just sort of perpetuates this, you know, this is um, a child that is separate apart and not what is, you know, part of the, quote, normal um, education system. Um, and that's just not the case. That's just, you know, somebody who learns in a different way, and I think we all learn in, in very different ways from each other. So I don't know that I have a perfect answer. Um, you know, I think it's a term that you may have to use in, in your practice, but I think also to the extent, um, you know, that you can talk about education for kids with disabilities or disabled kids um, and, and their rights, um, you know, that, that um, I'd, I'd say best practice would be to, to strive for that, you know, bearing in mind those, those limitations. Um, okay, so moving um, back to accommodations strategies. Um, so one of the, of the main ones that I think is, is very useful is, is flexibility. And I know as a, attorneys we can uh, develop and, and legal advocates, we can develop um, set ways of doing things. We have our, our policies and procedures with respect to our intakes um, and how we, we manage those. And so, um, you know, and, and, and often those, those policies and procedures and the way we do things are, are necessary given our limited resources. Um, you know, and um, the, the volume of work that we all have. Um, but it is important um, to be flexible and to the extent that it is possible um, to make those accommodations for our clients. Um, and of course, there is our, our obligation um, under the law. Um, so a couple of things, um, especially when we're talking about uh, intakes or client meetings, um, a couple of, of common areas where flexibility can be very helpful is um, with the length of the session. Um, and you'll see a lot of these things are things that we talk about with our clients anyway, um, but can be particularly important um, for folks with disabilities. Um, so the length of a session, that might vary based on somebody's need for breaks or um, their need for time to process what has happened in, in the session um, or simply to deal with, with fatigue. So for some folks having, um, you know, uh, more shorter sessions um, will allow them to process better. Um, and to manage fatigue better and, and have that time to refocus for others. Um, maybe, you know, one longer session is best um, 
for example, in a situation where you might be discussing um, the, the facts of a case um, and there is trauma involved and, and discussing um, those things uh, are a trigger, then maybe having one long session will be helpful to, to minimize um, those triggers. Um, another place where flexibility can be very helpful is with the start and end time of sessions. Um, you know, some folks might have um, a better, uh, might process better, you know, in the morning versus in the evening. Um, and then the other place where, where flexibility is important is with respect to breaks. Um, you know, some people may benefit from more shorter breaks. Um, and other people may um, be fine with, with less breaks, but maybe they need to be a little bit longer. Um, so things to consider, um, particularly when we're talking about client meetings and intakes. Um, and with all of these things as we are discussing them, I, you know, one important thing to keep in mind is um, you know, to ask your client what they need. And that's how you're going to find out you know, which one of these things might be helpful, um, or, you know, there may be something that we don't discuss that's, that's helpful to your, your client. Um, so having um, those conversations, asking those questions is important. Um, another uh, common kind of accommodation that, that comes up a lot is with respect to um, communication. Um, and two main areas um, that I run into a lot is, uh, one is frequency. Um, so how often do I need to be communicating with my client? Um, is this someone that I need to check in with often? Um, you know, is a, once every, a call every couple of weeks um, work or, you know, do, do I need to be um, sending a check-in email maybe every week? Um, depending on the, on the situation, um, that's something that can be helpful and that ties into um, uh, the method of communication. Um, you might need to uh, communicate um, for some folks, um, written communication may be better. Uh, for others, oral communication may be better, um, and being willing to have that flexibility to use both, and I know we often do in our practices. Um, if you are using written communication, making sure that those, um, that what you're writing um, is ex in an accessible format for your client, whether that means um, using large print, or that um, means using, um, you know, a particular kind of language. Uh, Sylvia will be talking a, a bit more about some different um, uh, accessible ways to, to um, communicate. Um, uh, and then the other thing I wanted to mention with respect to, to written communication is that, you know, that can also vary. Um, depending on the client. Um, you know, for some people, uh, getting a hard copy letter is going to be um, more manageable than getting an email. For some folks, text is easier. Um, you know, there may be something that I don't mention that is, that is um, you know, something that um, is be best for your client to be able to take in information and, and process it. Um, so again, flexibility around um, how often to communicate um, and how you are communicating is important. Um, uh, a couple of examples that, I, um, that um, have come up as far as written communication. Um, there are some, uh, on occasion, um, I have had clients who have um, requested that I give them an advance 
what it is we're going to be talking about during a client meeting, um, or that I summarize what the action items are, you know, the things that, that, that they um, need to do at the end um, of our conversation or our meeting. Um, and sometimes those things are requested in writing. And I just wanted to uh, flag with respect um, to anything in, in writing that it is important to be careful about attorney client privilege and to mark those documents um, confidential and privileged, um, especially if they're, if they're going in, in the mail. Okay, um, another area uh, of um, uh, general accommodation strategies that um, comes up for us quite often. Um, and I, I forgot to mention earlier, I run a workers' rights disability law clinic. Um, and so um, much of what I talk about comes from um, experiences I've had in um, running that clinic and, and doing intakes with, with folks um, through that, that clinic and, and our helpline. Um, so environmental needs um, and being mindful uh, that sometimes you may need to modify um, a physical environment. Um, so for example, lighting um, might be an issue for someone. Um, some folks have, have light sensitivities um, and need dim lighting. Um, they may need um, a different kind of lighting, um, you know, fluorescence versus something that is um, a warmer light because it might um, cause headaches, for example. Um, so things to keep in mind with respect to lighting. Um, also noise in the environment. Um, for some people, noise can be very distracting. For example, if you have a, a client with um, ADHD, some of the things to keep in mind might be uh, the location of where you're having their meeting and what, you know, traffic is um, around that area. Um, you may want to put out, you know, if, if you don't have an option and, you know, you have a, a small space, um, you know, giving uh, you know, folks notice that you are having a, a client meeting and you need some quiet um, can be helpful. Um, sense, I think best practice um, is to have a scent free environment um, and to let folks know that they, you know, if, if they're coming in, um, you know, that you do have a scent free environment and, you know, th if they could please not wear um, colognes, perfumes, etc. And as far as, oh, sorry about that, um, a layout and seating, um, this is something that can come up, again, when, when folks might um, feel triggered by an environment or unsafe, sometimes just being able to have control about where in a room they're sitting um, can be helpful to reduce um, anxiety and give um, uh, folks that sense of, of safety and, and comfort. Um, the other place this can come up is with folks with um, mobility, uh, that use mobility equipment. You know, important to have space for that. Um, same with, with assistance animals, to have um, sufficient space where you're, you're at to accommodate those things. Um, and just generally being mindful of, of distractors. Um, in the area where you might have um, the meeting or, or the intake. Um, so these are some very general sort of most common um, kinds of accommodation requests that we um, get in our conversations with our clients or that come up for us most often. Um, and now I'm going to transfer over to Sylvia uh, to talk to us about some practical client-centered tips um, around accommodation. Thank you, Alexis. And I hope this is a little better for you to hear, but um, <laughs> we, I will just try to do my best. Um, so in terms of the, the practical client center tips, I, I think a lot of these are actually really, Alexis has covered um, many of them, but also some of them really have to do with 
thinking through carefully the ways we're used to communicating with our clients and with one another. Um, so one of these first things is, you know, as, as Alexis has said, to, to, to actually work through things that we often typically take for granted. Um, for example, we may be used to going through a, a certain level of chit chat when we meet someone or when we meet someone again. And it's something that helps us to feel comfortable sometimes. It may help the other person. But you have to really think through. It may not be a useful thing um, with some of your clients. Um, and also the, the consider listening more than you, you might typically or asking leading questions. You know, I'd like to know what's on your mind. Please start whenever you would like to begin. Uh, uh, as uh, some of my friends and relatives point out, uh, uh, and they blame it on my profession, I, I, I'd like to sometimes control the parameters of uh, a verbal discussion. But that's a habit that um, I have to try to let go of um, when I'm working with clients um, who may have, uh, or who have intellectual or psychosocial or other disabilities. Um, be attentive particularly for early revelations of either accommodations that are needed or preferred. Um, sometimes someone will just come up with, oh, I hate it when, when people do X. And that's something to keep in mind in your own interactions with that person. Um, and gauge the usefulness of active listening. Uh, one of my own tendencies is to, is to, uh, to make little sounds sometimes, just, oh, yes, right, to indicate that I'm listening. That can be useful for, for another person, and it may be distracting for another person. Um, something like repeating or paraphrasing what the other person says can be, again, be very useful for the other person, or it can be distracting. Um, so think, uh, looking ahead also, um, to the next slide. Uh, it's often useful to uh, anticipate and explain the need for sensitive information. Um, sometimes, again, we may take it for granted and some of our, our more sophisticated clients may feel, may be very comfortable or know that they have to share a certain information in a legal context or when they're making a complaint. And other clients may not know that or may not remember that. So sharing that why information is needed. Um, also anticipating concerns about um, being being about share about uh, being judged about how someone may may feel. I mean, be careful of your own statements. Oh, everyone doesn't like this or people react to this way and just be very careful about making sort of conclusory statements or having conclusion conclusory statements in your own speech um, providing time and alternate chances to share information as uh, alexis has also said um, and be be creative and thoughtful about exploring other information sources and of course we can speaking speaking with their clients about that too, about other ways that your client may make information available to you, uh, if they if it's difficult for them to remember something or for them to recall details. Um, keeping keeping also in mind confidentiality and, and privilege, but it's just a, a a way to think through other sources of information for the kinds of details you may need. Um, in your own, in the, the case you're building. And I will turn this back to Alexis now. I think you might be on mute. I apologize, everyone. I, I was on mute. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and um, discuss some accommodation strategies uh, that may be particularly helpful for folks with psychosocial disabilities. Although, again, I want to emphasize the importance of asking uh, your client about what they need because, 
you know, not that all the same accommodations work for everyone. Um, and so um, finding out what, what that is, um, what is helpful for your client um, is always your, your best bet. Um, and, you know, to that point, um, making, um, you know, the, the environment um, and your communication with your clients, one in which you, you're encouraging your client to communicate what it is they need. Um, so, for example, in a meeting, you might ask about whether um, the client is okay with the lighting or if they're comfortable sitting where they're sitting um, or if there's anything about the environment. Um, that um, they would like you to change or um, is making them um, uncomfortable. And, you know, just letting the client know that, that you want them to feel um, safe and comfortable in, in the environment and that, um, you know, if they can share with you information on how to do that, um, then that can help you um, do it. And it, with having those conversations, um, you know, it can also be helpful in identifying and reducing triggers. Um, and as Sylvia said, you may not always have information um, about, um, you know, what someone's triggers might be. That might be something that um, develops over the relationship uh, with the client. And so, um, you know, when, when you have that information um, and, and you learn about it, um, you know, ask questions about what the best response might be, um, you know, what, what to do with respect to whatever the, the trigger is that is going to put um, the client um, back at ease and, and do that. Um, um, another very um, common and, and helpful um, accommodation uh, for folks with psychosocial disabilities is um, having a support person um, present when they come to a clinic or a client meeting. Um, this can get tricky. Um, again, uh, we need to be careful about um, the attorney-client privilege. Um, and we're going to be talking a bit more about this in, in a few minutes. Um, but you know, we we only maintain the privilege if that person is is necessary um, to the litigation, and um, you know the role is is very um, important. And you know, I as um, typically, um, if someone uh, would like to bring a support person to the extent possible, you know, I explain to them that in our in our conversations, um, it's. It's best if, if we're having um, a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but there may be situations where um, that support person is necessary. Um, and so having that, that discussion and figuring out with your client how to proceed um, is going to be important. Um, support animals, <laughs> uh, less tricky, um, but, you know, letting um, people bring in um, their support animals, making space for that um, is important. And um, also discussing timing um, with your client um, and what it is that is going to be happening. Um, you know, for some folks, for example, with, with PTSD and other um, uh, kinds of trauma, sometimes, you know, knowing that they're going to be talking about what has happened to them um, may be triggering and might, um, you know, cause them to um, avoid um, and, and maybe they don't, you know, come to the meeting um, or answer the phone call. And so sometimes what can be helpful is, is to talk in advance about um, what, you know, the interaction is going to be like, um, what you're going to be talking about, and talking um, beforehand if there's anything you can do um, to reduce those triggers and make it easier uh, for that person to, to um, be there and, and discuss what, what we have to talk about. Um, the other thing is, is giving folks um, extra time and notice, um, again, to, to process um, some of these things. Okay, um, just a few more th um, 
common accommodation strategies uh, to go through um, reminders and refreshers. Um, you know, I often ask uh, clients if they, you know, need me to text them reminders about their meetings. Um, if, uh, you know, for some folks, um, summarizing a prior visit because they have memory and concentration um, issues can be helpful. Uh, again, reviewing those action items about um, what it is um, you need to accomplish. Um, Providing clear expectations. Um, again, explaining to folks what it is you're going to do in the meeting and what it is you're expecting from the client, whether that's you know information, um, bringing in particular paperwork. Um, and the last thing is just checking in um, with a client, whether it's in the meeting or um, in the days leading up to it, uh, you know, to make things, sure things are, are going okay. Um, that you're taking breaks when you need them, um, those kinds of things. Um, and we're going to go ahead and switch over to Sylvia to talk a bit about um, some common accommodation strategies uh, for folks with intellectual disabilities. Thank you, Alexa. This will be quite quick because many of the strategies are very similar to, for people with intellectual disabilities, are similar to those that Alexis just covered for people with psychosocial disabilities. Um, and one thing just to, to, to be clear about here as well, and I've heard this from people, various people with disabilities, that developmental disabilities are not necessarily the same as intellectual disabilities. Someone may have both, but not necessarily. Someone with speech, speech um, with functional speech difficulties or who has um, uh, communication disabilities may not necessarily have an intellectual disability. And I think that's one of the strongest stereotypical associations we make, that if someone is not communicating, then they also have an intellectual disability. Um, for those individuals who do have intellectual disabilities, the, the importance, again, of allowing participants that the client wants, but taking extra steps to make sure that the client is in control and is making decisions as they are capable of making them. Um, Using simple language, which can be difficult for attorneys, uh, but not, not baby talk, um, leaving enough time, and also limiting the amount of information that's given at one time. And I think this also can be very challenging for, um, for lawyers and in the legal situation where we want to say, okay, so there's A and B and C, and these are the things that you're supposed to deal with. Um, and that's not something that will necessarily be effective. Looking at the next slide, uh, much of it, again, is, this, is the same as, as uh, uh, Lexus has mentioned, um, encouraging questions, uh, and also the, the, the importance of you making notes or potentially asking the client to make notes or for a summary at the end, a verbal summary at least, to confirm what the client understands. Um, and if you make notes yourself, you can help to supplement the client's summary as needed. Um, and notes will also be useful to you in your next appointment uh, with a client with an intellectual disability. It will help you to review what you spoke about at the last meeting um, and that, that think through the tasks that need to be done at the current meeting. Thanks. So. Back to you, Alexis. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, I did want to take some time to talk about um, accommodation strategies and uh, intersectionality and things to consider when you're working with folks uh, with multiple marginalized uh, identities. Um, so um, many of you have probably heard the term intersectionality. Um, it's a theory that emerged from uh, the US Black feminist and, and women of color activist community. The term itself uh, was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 um, and uh, around the idea um, you know that folks have different identities um, you know that they're that they're living all the time and um, that they may face uh, 
various kinds of oppression based on these on these different um, identities. And so when when working uh, with folks with multiple marginalized identities, it's important um, to develop awareness of your own values, your own privilege, um, your beliefs and, and biases. That way you can identify any issues that might interfere with your relationship with your client um, and will allow you to, to provide your best advocacy. Um, you know, sometimes we make assumptions based on our own um, experience and, you know, develop opinions about folks that may not be accurate um, because, you know, we're, we're looking at things from our own perspective. And so it's important, again, um, I know I've said this a lot, but don't make assumptions, um, you know, and, and be mindful of um, the extent, um, you know, that, that, that these various identities um, can influence um, situations and, and in, in understanding and building this awareness, um, you're going to be better equipped to um, um, have that um, provide um, the best advocacy that you you can. Um, again, be mindful of the language that you're using. It's important, um, you know, to to be mindful of you know criticizing, for example, cultural or, or religious uh, traditions or values, or or overlooking um, those. It's important to to listen and to not minimize um, or ignore the lived experience of of your client, um, and to make sure that that you know you you don't assume that you understand um, because unless you've had that experience, you you don't understand. And so to develop that um, uh, an awareness and be able to provide that advocacy. Your, your client is going to be the best source of that information. Um, and just a quick note about overlapping uh, discrimination. I think more and more um, uh, the law and attorneys um, are becoming um, more aware of how intersecting um, identities can um, result in um, oppression and discrimination on, on various fronts and it's important uh, to listen for that um, as well and you know it may turn out um, that there are different areas that you need to address in your in your advocacy um, and keeping that in mind um, in your rep and your representation in your interactions with your client um, is going to be important um, Sylvia on to you yes Hi, Alexis. Um, I know we're running low on time, so the next few slides are a summary, and I think I'm going to skip that for the most part and go on to slide 19, where we talk about the ABA Model Rules of Professional Conduct. The, the one thing I wanted to mention, which hasn't come up so much, is, is for us working in an office, our, our colleagues are really a resource to us. Uh, as we work with different kinds of clients and and also to be aware that um, there can in that your clients will also have interactions with their colleagues in certain ways for example if you have a client that has a support animal I mean the legal issues may be less complex but there can be a, a complexity of interaction there and so making sure your colleagues know for example that this is a working animal um, and not a pet that that um, that can be like uh, treated as a pet in some ways, and also being aware of maybe some of your colleagues have allergies or other uh, issues with animals, and and having to work through that because this is both um, a, a personal accommodation and also an environmental one. So, looking at one of the last topics we want to cover here, which is the ABA model rules of professional conduct. So the American Bar Association has a set of model rules, and Rule 1.14 deals with clients with diminished capacity. Part A talks about the client-lawyer relationship. So I will read from it as it's on the slide, and for some of you um, uh, who can't see the slide, uh, I'll just read ahead. When a client's capacity to make adequately considered decisions in connection with the representation is diminished, 
whether because of minority mental impairment or for some other reason, the lawyer shall, as far as reasonably possible, maintain a normal client-lawyer relationship with a client. That part, I don't think was so much of a problem, but the next part, part B, uh, is an issue that has come up in California very strongly. Part B, when the lawyer reasonably believes that the client has diminished capacity, is at risk of substantial physical, financial, or other harm unless action is taken, and cannot adequately act in the client's own interest, the lawyer may take reasonably necessary protective action, including consulting with individuals or entities that have the ability to take action to protect the client and, in appropriate cases, seeking the appointment of a guardian ad litem, conservator, or guardian. And there's also a part C about um, when this happens, uh, the lawyer is impliedly authorized under Rule 1.6a to reveal information about the client, but only to the extent reasonably necessary to protect the client's interest. So, um, California has been engaging in a multi-year uh, process to reconcile uh, California's own rules of professional conduct with the ABA model rules. Um, and at different points has come up with, with proposals for reconciliation. So in 2009, the state bar was considering uh, adoption of model rule 1.14. A coalition of disability rights organizations submitted public comment criticizing the rule as too vague and broad. It, it allowed attorneys to inappropriately compromise clients' personal autonomy and confidentiality. In, in potentially unwarranted situations. There was a lot of discretion given to individual attorneys to just sort of decide, well, this seems like my client could be at risk and then you could compromise confidentiality and, um, and privilege. So uh, the, the, the groups that took part in the 2009 letter included DREDF, um, Disability Rights California, the Disability Rights Law Center, um, Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, uh, Justice and Aging, um, a number of groups. And this led, you know, well, we credit ourselves with it leading to an outright rejection of the model rule 1.14 by the California Supreme Court. Wow. In doing so, the, this really was the only part of the ABA model rules that the California Supreme Court rejected outright. And in their order adopting the new rules, the court ruled, quote, the request to approve proposed rule 1.14 regarding a lawyer's obligations and representation of clients with diminished capacity is denied. So I, as, as advocates, we're, we're not saying that the situation of representing clients with diminished capacity doesn't deserve a lot of thought, a lot of consideration, and perhaps uh, uh, modification of some of the rules. We just didn't think model rule 1.14 was the answer. So I think we're a little over time and we apologize for that. Um, Alexis, was there anything else that you wanted to, to add? I, I think I'm done <laughs> with my part and we're happy to ask any questions and uh, if anyone would like to ask them at this point in the chat box. This is Alexis. Uh, the only thing that I was going to add is um, my apologies for us being over time and uh, that if there are questions um, that we don't get to today because of the time crunch, um, you have uh, Sylvia and um, my contact information currently um, on your screen. Um, and so if you'd like to um, contact us um, later, uh, that is certainly um, available to you. Um, and I think that's, that's it from, from me.
thank you all very much for um, joining us. And I believe uh, Lauren um, of WAC is going to have some closing words uh, for you all. Yes, and um, are you able to hear me? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Um, there was a question about the hypotheticals um, in the slides. Since um, all of the attendees will be receiving the slides, which include the hypotheticals we did not get to today, is it possible to receive model answers from you about answers to the hypotheticals? I, I have, yes, I think that's an, uh, an excellent question. Um, is it possible to mail something, email something out? I, I'm not, I, I'm wary, uh, I, I just don't want to take up people's time more on the webinar sure. right now. Sure, yes, we, could we, also... can ask, we can absolutely follow up by email, um, and I can go ahead and make sure that um, everyone receives what you are able to send over. Um, and I have just a brief exit speech for you all, which I will send in the chat as well for anyone who may be having difficulty hearing um, based on the sound. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Accessibility for People with Disabilities in Direct Legal Services, Intellectual, Developmental, and or Psychosocial Disabilities. And thank you to our presenters for sharing this training with us. We will distribute materials and MCLE certificates after reviewing today's in-session time. You will likely receive them within three business days. We hope that you will check out our next webinar, Is Your Community Playing Fair? California's Fair Play Act, AB 2404, and Gender Discrimination in Youth Sports on October 24, 2019, from 12 to 1 p.m. for one hour of general CLE. There are more trainings in this accessibility series to come. Register by visiting www.lacconline.org and go to upcoming training. You can find more information about this and other LAC programs and benefits by visiting our website at www.lacconline.org or by following us on Facebook and Twitter. You can also email us at trainings at lacconline.org with any questions about our online and in-person training. Thank you for your time this afternoon. We hope to see you all soon at our upcoming trainings.